Throughout the rest of this lesson, our main tool for learning about Ruby will be the Rails console. Let's start it up. Now, uh, there's actually a shortcut for this, just Rails C, in case you're curious. And the Rails console is closely related to something called IRB, which is uh, the uh, interactive Ruby prompt that comes with, uh, with every installation of Ruby. And it's essentially just a, an interface to IRB that adds in a bunch of Rails-specific stuff, including access to the Rails uh, controllers and models and, and so on. Part of what's nice about the Rails console is that it gives you a way to administer a Rails application. You can just uh, you can execute commands and even affect the, the database. So in this case, we have to be a little careful that we're not going to affect the database in, in our sample application, although there's not a whole lot that we can, uh, that we can do right now. There's not a lot of harm to be done. Uh, I'll show you later on in this tutorial series how to start the console in such a way that you can't possibly hurt the database. But in this case, we're not going to be doing anything dangerous, and so it's, this is fine. So I'm going to put up this application helper just for reference, and because we're going to start with this idea of a comment. So one of the things you can notice at, at the Rails console is that it can do arithmetic, as any computer can. And one of the things you can do in the console, which you don't have to, but uh, and, and which you rarely do, but just to show that, in fact, this is a comment character that gets ignored by Ruby, I can do something like this, integer addition. Of course, Ruby can do lots of other stuff, and, and we won't principally be uh, interested in doing arithmetic in this tutorial, but uh, we will be dealing a lot with strings. So let's talk about strings a little bit. Web applications ultimately consist of doing lots of stuff and then returning a string of HTML text back to a browser. So let's take a look at a string. This is what's called a double-quoted string, and it's empty. And here's a non-empty string. Now, like integers, strings can be added, and this actually makes me a little bit unhappy. Um, Ruby, like a lot of languages, uses the plus operator for string addition. So foo pu plus bar here is just foo bar. Um, the reason this is a little bit weird, I mean, it makes sense, but addition typically is a commutative operation, so that foo plus bar is the same as bar plus foo. Um, in the, if, if foo and bar were algebraic bar variables, uh, that, that would be the case, but obviously bar plus foo is strings, is bar foo instead of foo bar. But in any case, plus is the concatenation operator for strings. In fact, you can do this. foo.concat bar just gives you foo bar. So that's a little bit about strings. Let's take a look at um, some of the things going on in this, uh, in this example. Here we've got local variable assignment. So lo lo local variable mean in this context means that this variable is not available outside of this this little area, the, uh, outside of this, you know, lines 5 through 10, base title is not defined, but inside it is. So we can do that in the console, too. Let's, let's give an example. First, underscore name. Let's say we've got, in a web application, you might be dealing with users who might have a first and last name. So here's first name Michael. Now notice that when I say first name equals Michael, it, act, it still returns something. What it's doing is it's returning what this expression evaluates to. So variable assignment returns the value that the thing is assigned to. So first name equals Michael returns the value first name. Let's take a look at a way to, uh, to turn this into a full name. So this is going to be uh, the hash sign open curly brace first underscore name. And then I'm going to put in a literal string, my last name. And this then just becomes my full name. And of course, you can do this, last underscore name equals hartle, and then say first underscore name space last underscore name. And it's just the full, it's just my full name. So this operation here is what's called string interpolation. If you've used Perl or PHP, you might be familiar with this idea. This in, in a PHP, for example, this would be written as this. But of course here, <laughs> it's just evaluated as a literal string. Notice that in this case, the string interpolation is more convenient than adding these things together. We could do first underscore name plus, this is concatenation, plus last underscore name. But in that case, there's no space. 
right? So we would have to do plus space plus. And now, as just as a reader of this code, I mean, you can figure out what it means, but this is much clearer. Like, you know exactly what this means. This is a first name and a last name interpolated into a string with a space between them. So this is the convention. This interpolation convention is what I, I pretty much would always use in this context. And in fact, that's exactly what, what gets used in this context over here. This says, interpolate the base title, and then put in the, a space, a pipe character, another space, and then interpolate at title. Now, one common thing you might want to do with the string is to print it. And unfortunately, in Ruby, the, the print command is not print. It's uh, put s, which stands for put string. And some people actually do say puts in this context, which I think is awful, but you know, there it is. So if you, you can put s a literal string. And notice that it actually printed it out. This, there, there's nothing in front of this foo here. It just printed it out to the, uh, to the console. And then it returned nil. So that's a hint about this very important object in Ruby called nil. What put as foo does is it has a side effect. And the side effect is to print out the string that is its argument. And then it returns nil, which is the, uh, a contraction for nihil, which just means nothing in Latin. So this is literally nothing. Nil is literally nothing. What that means is that put as foo evaluates to nothing, but it has as a side effect the output of this of uh, whatever the string is that you put into it. You can also put as a variable. In this case, first underscore name is a string, and so it just puts it out. Ruby does have a print function. Take a look at what this does. Now you see what happened there. It printed out Michael, and then right away had uh, has the, the nil result. So we can understand this by, by doing this. Let's put this in a double quoted string, hash sign, let's interpolate it in, and then put a backslash n, which is a, a new line. Now we've replicated put s uh, first underscore name. So print and then a string with a new line is the same as put s. If it were up to me, I would reverse these because I feel like if you if you put a string, it should be it should just put the string. And print is much more descriptive of what you're doing here. And in fact, in Python, uh, Python doesn't have put us, but in, in Python print is what put us is in Ruby. But we're stuck with it, and it's, it's good enough. It's still a really nice, convenient way to be able to, to print out strings to a console or, um, or to a log or something like that. So you, you may have noticed so far that I've been referring to strings as double-quoted strings. So this is a double-quoted string, foo. But Ruby supports another kind of string called a single-quoted string. Let's take a look at this. Well, it doesn't look any different, does it? In fact, the console actually outputs the, uh, the single quoted string as a double quoted string. Uh, but there is a difference between these two things, and we're going to take a look at that now. Let's take a look at quote foo backslash n. That looks like that. Now let's look at the same thing except with a single quoted string. Now look at that. It's a very subtle difference, but here instead of a single backslash, there's a double backslash. That indicates that it's a literal backslash. Now this thing here is foo with a new line character after it. This thing here is foo with a literal backslash and then the character n. And you, you can get that with the double quoted string by explicitly putting in the double backslash. But oftentimes it's convenient not to have to worry about that double backslashing. And so single quoted strings are good for, for that sort of purpose. So let's take, take a look at put s foo backslash n versus put s foo backslash n single quoted. You can see in this case, there's actually an explicit backslash n in the output. As you might be able to guess from this, what a single quoted string does is actually just literally put out whatever you put into it. And that means in particular that whereas you can do something like this, with this uh, double quoted string, first underscore name, space, last underscore name. Oops. OK, so I, I actually put two quotes there, and now it's expecting another, uh, another quote somewhere. So I'm just going to Control-C it and do this. There we go. <laughs> that will happen to you, so I might as well show you it. I made the mistake. And Control-C is your friend in this context. So you can see it just output the, the full name. If you put this in single quoted strings, see if you can guess what will happen. 
<laughs> right. So it actually escapes out this hash sign with a backslash, backslash, hash sign, backslash, hash sign. And so this is just what it is, right? It's, it doesn't do any interpolation at all. Um, so you have to be careful about this because sometimes uh, you, you might fall into the habit of using single quoted strings in a certain context and then be surprised to discover that you can't interpolate into it. Um, you think that, oh, that won't happen to me, but it's happened to me lots of times. So, you know, maybe it won't ever happen to you, but you're luckier or a better programmer than I in that case. So this gives us a basic understanding of what strings are and, and uh, you know, we can print them out to the screen and we can interpolate them, but uh, a lot of string manipulations involve uh, calling methods on strings. So strings in Ruby are objects, as indeed are all things. Um, everything in Ruby is an object. And what you do with an object is you call methods on it. So let's take a look at a string here. This is a, a literal string, foobar in double quotes. And now I'm going to call a method on it with a dot operator, dot length in this case. You can see that it just returns six, which in fact is the length of the string foobar. So there are a whole bunch of methods that you can call on uh, on strings. Let's look at a few more examples. This is a useful method, the empty method. And notice that foobar.empty question mark returned false. Any method that ends with a question mark in Ruby is a Boolean method. That is to say it takes on one of two values. It's either true or false. And lots of methods in Ruby are are Boolean methods, and this convention is really nice because it lets you see at a glance that a method is Boolean. Um, sometimes there will be uh, Boolean methods that don't end in a question mark, but you can be confident that if it is a question mark, it will uh, it will be a Boolean method. So what is foobar.empty question mark test? Well, it tests to see if this is the empty string, and there is one unique empty string, which is this. You can actually represent it a couple different ways. Here's the double quoted empty string, and so if you call dot empty question mark on that, it's true. And you can also do it with single quoted strings. That's also the empty string. One of the things that Boolean methods are good for is control flow. What that means is that sometimes you want to do one thing in one case and another thing in another case. And so oftentimes Boolean methods will uh, play a role in that. So let's, let's uh, define a string equal to foobar. And then I want to say if s dot empty question mark just return the string is empty else if it's not empty which you might suspect will be the case else the string is not empty and then you end with an end and so you can see what happened here is this Ruby code said if s dot empty question mark, that's if foobar dot empty question mark is true, then return the string is empty, else the string is not return the string is not empty, and the string is not empty. So what happens is it goes to the second branch. Now if you've done any computer programming at all, you'll be familiar with this sort of control flow. So this is just to show you that Ruby has if else in uh, in its repertoire. And you can see here that we're we're using the same construction in, in, the, in the title helper. We have if at title.nil. So this you can guess now that nil question mark is a Boolean method because it's got this question mark. And you can even guess what it does. What it does is it tests if the object it's called on is nil. And you might be able to infer from this that at title as an instance variable is nil by default if it's not defined. In that case, just return base title. Otherwise, return um, this uh, interpolated string. Now, notice I use the word return there, as we'll see later on in this lesson. We don't actually need an explicit return keyword. Uh, Ruby does have it. I could type return here, and it wouldn't change anything. But by default, Ruby functions just return the last value evaluated in their body. There's another important aspect of Boolean methods that I'd like to cover, which is their combination using logical operators. So for example, let's set x equal to foo and y equal to the empty string. And now I'm going to say put s, both strings are empty, if x dot empty and y dot empty. 
and notice it said nil. It didn't put anything out. It didn't put any strings. It didn't print anything. That's because even though y dot empty is true, x dot empty is false. So what happened here is that uh, Ruby evaluated this expression x dot empty is true, true and false is sorry, it's actually false and true uh, is false, and so it didn't bother printing anything. But of course, you can also use the logical or operator and say if either of these things is empty, then you can say one string, one of the strings is empty. Whoa, what happened there? One of the strings is empty. So this double pipe character is the or character. Again, if you've done much computer programming, you'll uh, recognize these characters. They're the same in lots of different computer languages. But not a lot of languages let you put an if statement here at the end um, of, a, of a statement. So put s this string if. So this is a nice construction. It's very compact. And this is equivalent to saying, let's just copy and paste this thing. We could say, let's do this one. We can also do this. if x dot empty or y dot empty, and then put this in here. And then the end keyword. So that's exactly the same. But if it's a sing if it's a one liner and if it if it in particular if it's a, if it's not too wide and it doesn't spill across the, the size of your page, then you can just stick this on one line. Ruby also has the not operator, so you can do put s x is not empty. If not x dot empty. And there's an equivalent way of doing this. You can use the unless keyword. Put s x is not empty unless x is empty. There we go. Now, the empty method can be called on more things than just strings. Uh, so let's try it out on something that we might think uh, would be empty. We, we talked briefly about nil, which is literally nothing in Ruby. There it is. Let's see if nil is empty. Nope, it's not empty. In fact, it's not not empty either. Uh, it raises what's called an exception. It says no method error. So this is our first exception in, in Ruby. And it says that there is no such method on nil. And then it gives us a guess. It says you have a nil object where you didn't expect it. You might have expected an instance of array. So that's a hint, actually, that array responds to the empty method. Uh, uh, so it's not just strings. It's strings um, and arrays. But in this case, we can actually convert nil to a string and get it to work. So nil.2s is just the empty string. So the, here we've called the 2s method on nil. This is two string. And it's the empty string. And so now we can do method chaining, nil.2s.empty. And that's true. So this gives us a hint about something that we saw in this title helper, which is it was actually the motivation for making the title helper. We saw before that if we didn't define the at title variable, then what we ended up with was just the base title and the pipe character by itself. In other words, when when at title wasn't defined at all, it was this thing just ended up being the empty string. And as you might be able to guess from this line here, if at title dot nil, if it's not defined, the instance variable is nil. That's when we serve up the base title is if the at title is nil. And so you might be able to infer based on those two pieces of information what, it's, what happens when you try to interpolate a nil variable. So let's interpolate nil. So what happened there is that we try, we interpolated nothing. And what this interpolation does when it encounters something that isn't a string is it calls 2s on it. So what happened here is we interpolated nil. Ruby called 2s on nil and got the empty string. And if you interpolate the empty string, you just get the empty string. So that's why before we had just the base title and the pipe by itself is because when you interpolate at title, and before it was as embedded Ruby, so let's, let's recall. This is, the, this is application.html.erb. Recall what we had before. We had the base title, and then we interpolated at title. 
So th this is this is a, it's effectively interpolation inside a template. This is embedded Ruby with an at title. This will when at title isn't defined, this will just be blank. It will be it will be not only blank, it will actually be empty. Let's take a look at this dichotomy here. We've got a title variable. And if I just type in title, what happens is a name error exception. So Ruby has said, no, I, I take ex there's an exceptional case has happened. That's what an exception is, some sort of exceptional situation. Undefined local variable method or vari vari variable or method title for main, which is just the, the console, um, which is an object. As I mentioned, everything in Ruby is an object, <laughs> including the thing we're working in right now. So here title just by itself isn't defined. Local variables have no value when they haven't been defined. But look at this, at title, at title is something. In fact, well, it's something in the sense that uh, it doesn't raise an exception. <laughs> it, title, title is worse than nothing. Title is, raises an exception. At title, is, at least, is, is nothing. And so what that means is if we interpolate at title, then we just get the empty string. So this is why the code that we had before, I'll just paste it in here. Oops. This is why this code just appeared like this when at title wasn't defined, because this thing here is, is just inserting the, uh, the empty string into the template. But of course, that's just nothing, and we ended up with this. Before moving on to the next topic, there's something I'd like to mention um, about uh, Booleans and control flow in Ruby. And in particular, I want to talk about the nil object. We saw empty string dot empty is true. And say I put in a space, that's false. So true and false are Booleans. There's only one other object that has a Boolean value of false other than the false object itself. So false, like as I said, everything in Ruby is an object. So false and true themselves are objects. In fact, we can find out what kind. Well, this is anticipating some later material. Well, let's see what class this belongs to. <laughs> it belongs to the false class. So there is a special class just for the, the false object. But there is one more quantity that is false, and that is nil. So if, so put, let's, uh, let's see how that works. You can say if nil. if nil hello, else goodbye, and it says goodbye, because nil is false. If false says, well, this is, it's false, so it doesn't do this, it does the next one. If nil, it just re evaluates as goodbye. Now, this might seem obvious. You think, well, nothing should be false, but th this is counterintuitive in Ruby for many programmers who come from other languages, because this it literally is the only object that's false other than false itself. In particular, things like zero, <laughs> are true. If zero, hello, else, goodbye, that says hello. And the same goes for things that are empty, like, as we'll see later, empty hashes or empty arrays. Now, in some other languages, such as Python, for example, all of these things would be false. But in Ruby, only nil and false are false. Everything else evaluates as true. And there's, uh, there's a trick for getting a Boolean version of anything, which is to use the not operator twice, right? because not negates itself. If you do uh, this twice, the exclamation point, which is read as bang, if you do bang, bang, nil, it's false. So th this will force it into uh, a, a Boolean state. So bang, bang, zero is true. Bang, bang, hello. Oh, I didn't like that very much, but it still said true, um, and so on. So you can do bang, bang. Well, this is anticipating arrays. This is an empty array. Bang, bang, array. So that tells you that an array is true. And this is not usually the case in other languages. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that. Now, there's only one more thing we need before we can have a good understanding of this, uh, this title helper, which is method definition itself, or function definition. And because Ruby is objects all the way down, methods and functions are the same. There's always some object uh, on which the function is being called. So usually, if it's a standalone, it's like a module function, I'll just call it a function. And if I'm calling it not explicitly on an object, I'll call it a function. But if there's a dot after it, 
or before it, then I'll call it a method. So for example, in this, I would refer to length as a method because it's being called with the dot operator, but they're really interchangeable. They're the same thing. So let's define a function in the context of this, uh, this console session. I'm going to call it string message. And notice here, I've given it an argument, which is I've just called string. You can call this anything. In fact, let's call it something crazy. <laughs> it can be anything. It doesn't have to be related to what, what the type is. So if, some, this is a stupid name for it, of course. If something crazy dot empty, let's just have a condition. And actually, let, let's do this. If something crazy dot nil. can uh, return its nil. And this is not, I almost said, let's print out its nil. This doesn't print anything. This returns its nil. Else, it's something. And, oops. and then, so we have an end. We have to end the if, and then we have to end the definition of, of the function. So the def keyword always takes an end at the end. Notice that I'm indenting things two levels, two spaces. Uh, this is the, s the standard throughout the Ruby world. Uh, I came to Ruby from Python, which uses four spaces for indentation. And so R Ruby looked really strange for a while. And in fact, in Python, you leave off the ends. So Ruby initially looked like Python, except with not enough tabbing and too many ends. And now I look at Python, and it, it looks like it has too much tabbing, and where are all the ends? So this is the way it goes. OK, notice that there, it actually did evaluate to something. It evaluated to nil or I guess it's something where something is nil. So when you do a, s a method definition, it actually does have a return value, which is nil. Um, now let's take a look at what happens if you call this string message. And so something crazy, let's, let's uh, have it be nil. It's nil. And then if we put something else, say an empty string, it's something. So notice what's happening here is that it's actually returning this value, which is uh, what I alluded to briefly before. That's what this, this title helper does. It actually returns the value. Uh, and Ruby does support a, a, an explicit return keyword, but you don't need it. And in many cases, it's convenient to leave it off. So there's one more uh, tricky thing I want to try right here. Let, let's see what happens if we do this. Let's do put s foobar. See if you can guess what will happen here. So remember what we saw before that put s actually has a side effect of printing out the thing, you know, of printing out its argument, and then it returns nil. So what happened here is that as a side effect, put s foobar printed out the, the string foobar, but then it returned nil, and that's what got passed into string message, and then it, it said if that something crazy dot nil is true, then it's nil. So uh, this is a, you would never really want to do this, but if you can understand why this happened, um, you're, you're way ahead of most of the Ruby pack, I think. We're now in a position to understand this title helper uh, nearly in its entirety. So let's take a look at it just for what it is, just in this context, this piece of it. So we now know that this line here is a comment line. We've learned that this is the a function definition. The title of it is title. It doesn't take an argument. Notice that before we, when we defined the, uh, we actually do an up arrow here. Let's go back up. When we defined the string message, we gave it an argument. So Ruby functions can take uh, an arbitrary number of arguments, or they can take no argument at all. And here we've defined a local variable, which is equal to a, a double quoted string. This would be the same if it were a single quoted string. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and then there's some control flow. If at title dot nil a question mark, then return base title. This is the, this expression, this if else end expression, is the last thing evaluated in this function. So this is what gets returned. In this case, it re just returns the base title. Else, interpolate the base title into a string. This does have to be a double quoted string. And then there's the vertical bar and uh, the at title variable interpolated into the string as well. So just to get a 
sense of this, let's take a look at what, hap what happens if you do a single quoted string. <laughs> so you see here that it just put in the literal base title, vertical character, add title. Um, in fact, our test would have caught this. Let's do that. Let's just uh, run the test suite. Ah, see, we've got failing tests all over the place. So there are just uh, two additional things to know about this. The first is that this at title variable uh, is automatically passed into this function by the controller, which is, uh, which is here in this case. So when we define it here, it automatically is available in this module. And the reason for that is because this module, this is the second thing we need to know about, it, which is this module is a piece of, uh, of self-contained code that gets included into uh, a class. And so we'll be learning about classes in more depth shortly. But the idea is that modules are a group of, of functions that can be used by, uh, by Ruby classes. And in this case, inside of a class, the instance variable at title is always available. That's pretty much what uh, instance variables are good for. And we've seen that in the context of Rails, usually what it means is they're good for, uh, for being present in views. But you can see now that inside of modules, these instance variables are also available. Uh, but because instance variables have this special property that when they're not defined, they're nil rather than uh, raising some sort of error, uh, we can use this test if at title.nil and have a base title. Now, ordinarily in Ruby, you have to include the module explicitly, but in Rails, this application helper module gets included in the, uh, in the controller classes automatically. This is just one of uh, several hints we'll see in this lesson that the way Rails uses Ruby is not the same as the way Ruby exists just by default, which is one of the reasons why I generally uh, suggest that you learn Rails uh, before you learn Ruby, if your primary interest is in learning web applications. You're, of course, free to read a 400, 500, 600 page book on Ruby before <laughs> tackling the Ruby on Rails tutorial book. But if you really want to make web apps and you have a uh, motivation to do that, then you can get by with surprisingly little Ruby. Uh, and that's mainly what we're covering in this lesson is the Ruby that you need in order to get going with a Rails application. Let's just make sure we're green. It's always a good practice. Good. 